my generation, which is today's consumer and trendsetting generation, which has been called by many names, the most popular being millennial, those born between the AIDS epidemic of the early 80s and 9-11. However, there are lesser known names, like the T-ball generation, called so because we were overly catered to and everything was handed to us without having to work for it like those that came before us. Another, my personal favorite, the microwave generation. Dubbed us on account of wanting everything lickety split. I want it when I want it, how I want it, here, now, fast. But right now, what any of us wants is grossly insignificant to our need to have a conversation involving prisons, which is where we've all gathered today to hold this TEDx event. The fact that you and I are exploring this particular topic implies that prisons will continue to be a fixture in our society. And to have prisons indicates that people will be committing crimes, or at least that we'll be locking them up. Now hold that thought. If a great portion of people who commit crimes are 25 and younger, who is it that's going to be entering these prisons, say, 15 to 20 years down the road? It won't be the baby boomers or the Pepsi generation. And it won't be the millennial slash t-ball slash microwave generation, who is the kindle that keeps the prison fire burning right now. No. Those projected to enter prisons tomorrow are the children of today. Your children, my grade school siblings. We can't possibly have a conversation involving prisons without first considering the future of our society. Because between the two, there exists a correlation, a link. To quote Kenyan novelist Ngugi Wa Thiongo, children are the future of any society. If you want to know the future of a society, look into the eyes of the children. If you want to maim the future of a society, maim the children. Thus, the struggle for the survival of our children is a struggle for the future of our society. The quantity and quality of that development is the measurement of the development of our society. In America today, we profess to be the leaders of the free world and both the protectors and advocates of human rights all over the globe. Yet there exists a travesty in our very own backyard that goes unnoticed by the American family as we become preoccupied with the happenings in the world at large. Our children are commodified and exploited in the media, targeted by big business advertisers, while at the same time, funding for educational and social programming is constantly being reduced. Recently, we've become aware of a concept known as the school to prison pipeline, which in and of itself is self-explanatory. And in reality, what we're talking about here is a child to prison pipeline. I mean, are not the majority of schools filled with children? A day that I'll never forget began with me waking up at 6.15 in the morning and walking to school, which was actually me running to school because I was running a little late. I was 16 and a sophomore eager for summer vacation. I distinctly remember it being a particularly sunny day in early May of 2006. After returning from lunch, sitting in graphic arts class, intent on classwork, and listening to music, I was called to the front of the classroom, where I was promptly handcuffed under the horrified gaze of my teacher and classmates. My last memory of freedom. But while I actually committed a crime that warranted the forfeiture of my freedom and thus incarceration, what about six-year-old Desiree Watson, who was taken from school to the county jail fingerprinted, given a mugshot, charged with a felony and two misdemeanors. Why? She threw a temper tantrum. Or how about the 25 middle school students, ages 11 to 15, who were arrested, detained, charged, and suspended from school for a food fight? To imprison a child is to remove his or her voice from this world. Can you imagine our world devoid of a child's innocent candor or laughter? Now, I'm in no way campaigning for us to be soft on crime. This is not that. But as a civilized nation, for us to have this lock em up tactic of dealing with a child as a means of incurring punishment and exacting retribution, opposed to rehabilitation, then we need to take a second look at ourselves in the looking glass beyond who we portray ourselves to be and examine the morality of the system, which is the driving force behind current legislation policies, and laws that make it permissible to maim the future of our society. 
We wouldn't dare dream of calling a 12, 13, or 14 year old peewee football player a pro and letting him loose out into a field in the NFL. Can you imagine? Wouldn't matter how good he was. But we'll let a child loose in prison. In America, we sentence children as young as 12 and 13 to serve decades. And prior to 2013, life sentences. More time than their underdeveloped brains can even conceptualize. More time than they've even been alive. What are we telling our children? Haven't we learned by now that children are observant and absorbent creatures? They're sponges. They soak up everything that they hear us adults say and do. Don't believe me? Let a curse word slip out in front of a toddler and watch them teach everybody they encounter the new favorite word. <laughs> Here the old adage, do as I say and not as I do, is rendered obsolete. Because children will almost always do as we do. And for this very reason, I challenge us all to be more conscious and aware of the messages that we convey to our youth. Because in today's world of mass information and advanced technology, there's not much that they aren't exposed to, pick up on, and process. We don't want to scare them straight by showing them that they're potentially prone to being subject to the lengthy prison sentences that some of their peers are subject to. No. What is of more importance is showing them that their future, investing in their future, a productive future for them, is our primary concern. Their education, their well-being, their future is your primary concern. Show them that you would much rather use the tens of thousands of tax dollars that it costs to house a single inmate here in the state of Washington to pay their tuition for them to get a four-year degree from the University of Washington. Our children are our most precious resources and assets that are to be invested and invested in. So again, I make a challenge. I challenge you all to carry on this conversation in your respective social circles and express the importance of others to become involved. It doesn't matter which generation you're a part of, baby boomer to millennial. Collectively, we all have a say in how we as a society invest in our future, which lies with today's children, to whom we are all obligated. And if there's one thing that we can be sure of, it is the fact that the future, our future, is the result of our conscious investment in the present. Thank you.